Uh, but now we're going to move on to our second talk. Uh, so Dr. Abelian, if you'd like to share your screen. Uh, Dr. Abelian is joining us from the Yale University School of Medicine, where she's an assistant professor focusing on identifying imaging biomarkers related to adult and pediatric brain tumors using a multimodal approach. And today, she's going to be talking to us about machine learning based data annotation tools in clinical packs, addressing the critical need for annotated data sets. All right, Dr. Abayan, if you unmute yourself, you should be ready to go. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm very excited to present on this topic. Um, and it, it is a little different topic because I'm more of a geneticist than a computer scientist. Uh, this is my uh, disclosure sign, uh, slide. I do have a research collaboration with Visage Imaging. Um, um, so um, to kind of get you, uh, get this started is my whole research career has been about characterization of phenotypes. I started in college where I, um, I studied uh, meiosis and um, a division uh, in tetrahymena thermophila and focused on telomeres. Um, in my MD PhD, I focused on Saccharomyces cerevisiae, where I looked at protein trafficking and I looked at images and different phenotypes as well, but also did a little bit of work on humans as well. Um, in my residency and fellowship training, I worked mostly on humans, but also a little bit on pigs in developing novel um, biomedical devices. And now at Yale, I work mostly on humans, uh, but also a little bit on rats, um, on uh, di uh, characterizing different phenotypes. And what has always been fascinating to me is actually brain tumors and um, and uh, other on oncologic uh, on, uh, other tumors. And uh, what's really fascinating about them is that they're so incredibly heterogeneous. So if you look at the tumor and you look at it at, from multiple different perspectives and different areas, you can actually see that there are diff different lineages within different parts of the tumor. So understanding the, uh, the tumor as a whole is very important in, um, and understanding how different parts fit into the whole. So when I, when I work in practice and I study uh, brain tumors in my daily clinical practice, um, I always uh, get very frustrated when I look at these kinds of images. This is a child with pilocytic astrocytoma that's been imaged over time. And as you can see that each of these scans were done at different times. And in the yellow, I actually highlighted the real measurements that were done for this tumor to compare uh, the size growth um, of the tumor as it, um, as the time went on. And as you can see, every single one of them is different. And this is an actual clinical practice and um, understanding of how this tumor is growing is very important for this child's management. Um, on top of it, we're measuring different parts of the tumor. We're measuring sometimes solid, sometimes cystic, comparing different areas, uh, but we're not really giving global volumetric measurements or really focused solid measurements or cystic measurements. Um, so this has always sparked my interest in terms of what to do, how to improve the tools we have in actual clinical practice. This is another case that I faced um, uh, that I faced um, recently, and um, this is a patient who presented with lung cancer and was found to have brain metastases, and the metastases were treated with gamma knife. And when I faced this case, um, I was looking at the images and I was saying, yeah, okay, some of these uh, lesions are getting bigger, some are smaller, some don't have enhancement anymore. Um, so it looks like uh, there are some of the lesions that are concerning for um, uh, metastasis progression versus not. But it turned out when we actually went to biopsy, one of these lesions was actually a glioblastoma and the rest of the lesions were metastases. And from just looking at it as a phenotype uh, characterization, it was actually very hard to tell. Um, and we spent a long time treating uh, this patient as a brain metastasis when they actually had a glioblastoma. So I always wanted to ask, can we do a little bit more to figure out what's going on? Because part of being in clinical practice is that it's daily lessons in humility. There's always times when you're on or when you're uh, learning something brand new. 
So I transitioned um, when I was doing my training, I transitioned from qualitative and manual semi-quantitative analysis to more of an automated um, quantitative analysis um, in my actual clinical practice. But to do this, um, I wanted to first do a very thorough literature review uh, because there's a lot of articles on applications of uh, machine learning tools for uh, characterization of brain tumors um, and particularly glioma. Thomas. And in the, um, our systematic review, we actually looked at 12,000, over 12,000 articles. And um, we reviewed full text of uh, over a thousand articles and identified that uh, close to actually 900 articles um, in the literature have to do with some kind of machine learning applications in gliomas. And then we split those based on different indications and try to figure out um, what algorithms we could apply to clinical practice to help us solve the problems that we have, the segmentation problem and also the classification problem. What we learned from this very giant review that took us over a year was that um, it's actually um, not a lot of data sets are available. Um, most of the studies were single center, but there, uh, there was also a very large amount of studies that used the available data sets, uh, BRATS and TCIA. Um, and uh, that the number of patients per study was actually fairly low for machine learning applications. On top of it, the data sets were highly curated. So the real world data that I see in actual clinical practice, which includes different imaging protocols, different scanners, motion, um, they were not as, of, as widely available and generalizability for my clinical center was limited. And these are the applications that different machine learning studies were used for um, in these studies. So um, the other thing we noticed is when we looked at the reporting quality in all papers, it turns out it's actually very low. And this is a paper um, uh, being developed by one, one of my students, um, and he is describing the tripod adherence index. And what he found uh, was that the lowest adherence to tripod was seen in reporting of outcome predictors missing data, participants, and model performance. So the question that we were asking is, how do we take these algorithms and translate it to our clinical practice at Yale when we, we can't even, understand, we can't even uh, have the information on model performance um, in the articles that we're reading? We've actually um, applied, uh, um, we've actually, um, uh, presented multiple posters at quite a variety of conferences on this uh, large collection of studies. And we found that the tripod adherence score was consistently very low among every single applications of machine le uh, learning studies in gliomas. Um, so whereas we started with the question, which algorithm should we implement for glioma segmentation and classification? Turns out that was the wrong question. Um, we actually needed to look at a three-part approach in terms of what is the data that um, is being used for the studies, what are the algorithms that are being used, and then what is the clinical interface integration? So uh, are, how, what is the ability to incorporate algorithms into clinical workflow? And um, basically um, the idea of reducing the need to change software during data annotation and clinical work. So we refocused our um, work and we formed a partnership with an industry, um, Visage Imaging, and um, these are the fantastic engineers that uh, work with us in our research collaboration, um, Dr. Khaled Kal uh, Busabara and Dr. Min Deling. And uh, we developed novel tools in PACS so that we are able to annotate the images in my clinical practice, which requires me to read studies fairly fast and um, really needs, um, the tools need to be very adaptable. So whereas when I was a fellow, I was doing this kind of manual contouring of tumors to characterize their, um, to do the annotations. 
I no longer do that. All of my work is now done in PACS, which is uh, where I do all, all my work on my clinical work. And all I have to do is I have specific hanging protocols and I have specific buttons that activate machine learning um, algorithms for different tasks that I need. So let's go over this very quickly. So here are the buttons that we use and they look very simple, but they're actually very complicated and take so quite a while to code them. And um, Khaled Busabara has done fantastic work in terms of doing that. Um, so for our glioma segmentation button, we actually use a unit algorithm that was trained on Brad's data set. And within four seconds, this uh, algorithm is able to segment our gliomas, then we're able to copy and paste them on all the sequences so we have multimodal data. Uh, we also have a button for uh, pyradiomics um, feature extraction and that extracts the data in the JSON file. And that's how we're building the Yale Glioma database. We're using this database for machine learning based classification tasks. And because this is the same packs that we use in our clinical practice, we're actually taking it to our reading room. So this is a picture of our reading room with one of my colleagues. And the way it's able to be done is this uh, a very clever design of the of the system where you're able to plug in the APIs and you can do the, um, the outputs in, um, in different file formats that you would want. So basically what, we're, what I used to do outside of clinical packs, um, I would have to download the DICOM, upload it into segmentation software, perform the segmentation, and then export the segmentation via nifty files. And this does not include copy and pasting of the data. Now I do it all in one step and I do this in actual clinical packs and I don't, um, I'm able to generate all of this information in multimodal format, which allows me to do it much faster and works with my clinical schedule. So what are we doing with this, uh, with these tools right now? So we're actually forming this three-pronged um, research network for collaborative discoveries, which is based on databases, algorithm and tool development, and clinical trials. For databases, we're working on the Yale glioma data set. We also have the Yale lymphoma data set. We have the pituitary adenoma data set. We also have a very large lung cancer imaging genetics data set. And we're building right now the brain metastasis data set, which um, uh, all part of our laboratory. For the um, algorithms, we have a unit auto segmentation tool for gliomas and brain metastases. Um, and then we also use XGBoost for classification. Um, of, we, right now we're only doing HGG versus LGG, but we're moving on to um, molecular subtypes as well. And then for clinical trials, because everything is easily translatable into actually my reading room, we're testing longitudinal tumor growth um, and we're planning to test the molecular subtype predictions in actual clinical practice in, uh, as a clinical trial. So this work was done, um, uh, the initial work was done by uh, one of our STAR students, uh, Sarah Merkai and um, uh, Eva Kazarian and Tal Zivi. And what they looked at is what they did is actually start this, the Yale glioma data set uh, from actually getting the database of patients to downloading the images and to actually doing the segmentations and classifications. And these are the students that are about to take over the project and take it to the next level. Um, but what uh, Sarah did actually, just over one summer, she was able to perform these kinds of segmentations of the whole tumor, the enhancing core of the tumor and the necrotic portion of the tumor. And in one summer, she did 440 fully segmented tumors. She was able to show that you can gradually train the algorithm on Yale data and start uh, getting uh, high die scores with, with very minimal data trained on Yale um, uh, data set um, after transferring the algorithm from the BRATS training. And she's, uh, this is her preliminary results for high versus low grade glioma prediction, which is fantastic. Um, so we're moving on to the next step of uh, actually predicting uh, different molecular subtypes and finishing the 2000 um, segmentations um, for this database. The other question that we decided to um, address is do growth curves provide valuable information to assess heterogeneous response to treatment? And um, 
this project was started by a very talented student, um, Gabriel Casinelli peterson and he looked at um, 404 brain metastasis lesions after gamma knife treatment, and he found that 75% of them over time had a heterogeneous response um, if you look at with an individual patient. And within PACS, he was able to generate these kinds of curves where, as you can see here, one of the tumor, so this is one one patient. So one of the tumors is actually growing and the other tumors are actually getting smaller. So when you're treating this patient, you really be, want to be focusing on this particular patient, uh, with this particular tumor. But if you only look at comparison of size, one compared to prior, you will, you, it won't be a significant change in size. So you may actually wait, the, uh, wait to treat the patient later. But with this growth curve, you know that you need to start treating. And then we also have different uh, presentations such as homogeneously decreasing, homogeneously increasing, and homogeneously stable. And uh, the paper that he's putting together is suggesting that we need to start incorporating these growth curves now that we can do them in PACS and do them in clinical practice into the criteria for treatment assessment. Another thing that um, Gabriel was able to do with Khaled is to develop this layout for, um, a format where you just do a single button click and you're able to do a hanging protocol, lesion alignment, and lesion measurement um, in a very fast manner so that you are able to generate these growth curves in real clinical time um, and then generate these graphs for our clinicians to, the, to do the analysis. So overall, um, as a neuroradiologist and nuclear medicine physician, I wanted to say that PAX is our clinical world. So if we're gonna be building large databases of annotated medical data, the tools need to be available for us in PAX. We cannot be opening other softwares because we really don't have time in our clinical practice. And this is what we're trying to do with volumetric growth curves of tumors, preoperative prediction of tumor grade, and prediction of molecular subtype. Now, all of this is done as a team. We have a fairly big group of students and a wonderful collaboration with Dr. Lin and Khaled Busabara. And um, I'm very grateful to our funding and our recent uh, great score on NCIR 21 grant. Um, and I just wanted to kind of hammer home as any uh, scientist, uh, science is not always glamorous. We have these wonderful pictures of uh, Pierre and Marie Curie um, uh, with their wonderful pictures, but, you know, they were they were hauling and, and processing lots of pitch blend for a very long time. And this is what we may have to do with um, uh, the work that we're doing uh, with annotating of medical images. Folks that are doing, that have genetics background, that have imaging, uh, clinical imaging background, have to sit down and manually annotate these images and to be able to, um, so that we can do uh, better machine learning algorithms. Do you have any questions? All right, so again, attendees, please enter your questions into the chat and we'll pass those along. Uh, thank you very much for the talk there. Um, I had a quick question while we're waiting to see if some others come in. Was a programming interface into the PAX system provided, or was this more of a collaboration with the PAX vendor where you handed off what you'd like to see happen and it came back as a button? So actually it's a collaboration. So I actually started, um, I would used to do segmentations in a lot of free, uh, freely available softwares. And that was taking way too long to generate the data sets that I needed. So we actually started having weekly miss, um, meetings with um, Dr. Lin and um, Khaled, who's actually doing his PhD right now. And uh, we des we would design exactly what we need for, for me as a neuroradiologist to, to use. And it went through many, many iterations actually. Um, so it's still considered beta, but we're planning to make it available very, very soon, um, now that it's um, very much more, very consistent now, actually. So um, it is actually a collaborative work because um, I don't think they would know exactly what I need as an industry uh, because uh, they're more of an engineering 
uh, background. And I would have no idea how to design these buttons myself because I'm more of a geneticist and radiologist. All right, we've had some questions come in here on chat from uh, Daria Malyarenko. We have, thank you for the excellent talk. Which contrast or combination unit did you find most informative for tumor segmentation? Oh, <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, honestly, I wish Khaled was here. Um, I, I, I won't be able to answer that question. Okay, uh, take that one offline. Um, and then we have a question from Raj Ramasamy asking uh, or saying it's very impressive to get that analysis streamlined into two clicks. How long did it take to develop the PAX interface? So I've been faculty for two years um, and we started intensively working with this group uh, about a year ago. So it's been a year long project. Excellent. Uh, well, maybe I'll have one more here if we don't have any more coming in from the audience. Um, you, you mentioned that you have the segmentation and figure feature extraction buttons put together. What, what's top of your most needed list for the next feature? So we're actually very excited about this because um, we are developing a universal oncology toolkit right now. Um, we started with the brain tumors, uh, so we have uh, these tools for, glio for preoperative glioma segmentation. We're planning to do postoperative glioma segmentation as well, but we need to finish the Yale glioma data set. Um, we now have this longitudinal uh, growth curves for multiple brain mats, so we're developing ways to do uh, multiple lesion analysis, and then we're actually going to take it to the body as well and try to do segmentations in PET uh, because it is very important uh, to have quantitative data for uh, treatment response assessment. So we want to develop this oncology toolkit that can be used for different cancers um, so that we can actually finally start asking the, gen the questions uh, that we have in clinical practice of how do tumors respond to therapy? Because uh, right now, the way we're, we're doing the response assessment is actually very limited. All right, thank you. Uh, there are a few more questions that came up in the chat, but in the interest of time, we are gonna have to move on. Uh, but if you're able to uh, reply to those in chat, uh, that would be wonderful. 